Those Liberals, Andrew Hastie and James Patterson, they join me now. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Good to be with you. Now, the Labor MP, Matt Keogh, who was scheduled to go on your China study trip, he says this episode shows the federal government, quote, must get the China relationship back on track. Uh, James, how do you propose Canberra do that? Well, I think it's worth pointing out, Tom, that Matt Keogh is dangerously out of step with the rest of his Labor parliamentary colleagues. Uh, Both the Shadow Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, and the Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, have strongly spoken up in our defence and said that we have every right to raise the issues that we did and that it's alarming that the Chinese Communist Party has banned us from visiting. Uh, I think what we've been going through over the last few years is a resetting of our relationship with China. And we're actually, although that process might appear messy, we're actually getting to a, a stronger basis now. We are getting to a more honest and sober assessment of our relationship. And I think, frankly, out of this, we will emerge stronger because we are more assertively standing up for our national interest, for our sovereignty and for our values, so we should. But if Beijing keeps denying entry to any Australian uh, who's criticised the regime, a politician, a business figure or an intellectual or journalist, Andrew Hasty, how then can our two nations have a cordial relationship? Well, it's a great question. And I just want to pick up on what James said. I think the, the short answer is... Uh, We need to have a relationship that's based from a position of principle and strength on our side. Um, Matt Keogh hasn't really defined what an optimum relationship looks like. And if that means that we need to be obsequious and and self-censoring in our relationship to China, well, then I reject that. I think we need to speak honestly. And I also agree that we are, we have begun the reset. It actually, I think, began under Malcolm Turnbull when he passed the Espionage and Foreign Interference Legislative Package his decision on 5G, securing digital sovereignty for future Australian generations. Important steps, and it's continuing under the current government. You know, these are there are little bumps in any relationship, and um, this past week has been one, I suppose, with James and I being banned from visiting China. Um, but at the end of the day, it's an opportunity for us as parliamentarians and for the broader Australian public to reflect on who we are as a country, what we stand for, and to think deeply about our economic and political relationship with China. Okay, but denying visas to hostile MPs is a pretty common behaviour for some countries. For example, China denied visas to uh, German parliamentarians just a few months ago, yet Angela Merkel, the Chancellor, she's reportedly planning to invite Xi Jinping to a big pan-European summit during her uh, European Council presidency. So, James, are we exaggerating the significance of Beijing's treatment of both of you? It's the first time any Australian members of parliament have been banned from visiting China, at least in recent years, Tom. So I think it is a significant uh, event. But you're right to highlight the fact that a German MP, in this case, a Greens MP who'd been raising the plight of the weaker people in Xinjiang, uh, has also been banned. In fact, Mm. her whole parliamentary delegation was going to be prevented from visiting if she remained a a member of that delegation. And I think that does point to something. It points to increasing sensitivity of the Chinese Communist Party and increasing willingness to be firm and probably too firm in this case in, in limiting its critics from travelling there and learning from them. Uh, I, I don't think that's a healthy uh, change that we've seen from China. I think it's a regrettable one. And now you both say that the, your Labor colleague Matt Keogh is out of step with his own party, but he's not out of step with the former Prime Minister uh, Paul Keating. This is what he told a strategic forum organised by the Australian newspaper. My concern is what passes for the foreign policy of Australia lacks any sense of strategic realism and that the whispered word communism of old is now being replaced by the word China. The subtleties of foreign policy and the elasticity of diplomacy are being supplanted by the phobias of a group of security agencies which are now effectively running the foreign policy of the country. Former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating this week, Andrew Hastie. Look, I reject that. Firstly, politics is ultimately a values proposition. And it's worth reflecting on our values, but also the values of the countries that we have diplomatic or economic relationships with. And of course, uh, China is a uh, one-party communist state, and you can't deny the influence of Marxist-Leninism on the regime over the last 70-odd years. And so it should form part of our calculus when, when dealing with China. I reject as well that the security establishment is running our foreign policy. Uh, they do a superb job um, protecting us from a range of threats, and they are right to point out threats to our sovereignty, whether it be through uh, covert foreign influence or interference or espionage or any, any other threat for that matter. 
Yeah, but if if China continues to grow relentlessly and the US retreats from the region under a Trump or a future democratic administration, this is Keating's argument. It's also Bob Carr's view, Hugh White's view. Uh, James Patterson, what can Canberra in those circumstances, what can we do to stop China from dominating the region? Well, we have to really set very clear boundaries now while we can before it's too late and before we can't. The alternative of rolling over and acquiescing uh, will just see further and further encroachment on our sovereignty and on the values uh, that we hold in our region. And that just does not bear thinking about. The alternative scenario here is is really what others have to argue for. Are these advocates saying uh, that we should just accept China's activities in the South China Sea? Are they saying that we should just turn a blind eye to what they're doing domestically on human rights? Are they saying that we should take no interest in their attempts to influence our politics uh, and our public debate? I think that is a road to giving up our sovereignty, not to uh, uh, Yeah, opinion varies here. The group that organised your trip to China, uh, that's now been banned by the Chinese, uh, China Matters, it was run by Linda Jacobson, past guest on this program. She was quoted in the Financial Review earlier this year. Whatever you think about China, financially and economically, there is no market that will replace China for decades as far as Australia is concerned. We can quibble over how Australia got here and we can all agree this kind of dependency is very unhealthy. The fact of the matter is, Australia is hugely dependent on China for its prosperity. China is going to be a trendsetter, a standard setter in a whole host of areas we haven't even thought about. This is a country we need to engage with deeply, whether we like them or not. Many in the security establishment who have been quite active in the public arena simply don't want to acknowledge this. That was uh, Linda Jacobson quoted in the Financial Review a few months ago. Now, uh, to the extent that that represents a significant body of opinion, this is not just Matt Keogh or Paul Keating or Bob Carr and Hugh White. This is a pretty significant segment of the business community. Andrew Hastie. Yeah, of course we need to engage with China. China isn't going anywhere. Geography is destiny and both of our futures lie in the Indo-Pacific region. We need to engage with China culturally, diplomatically, economically. No one denies that, but we must do it from a position of strength, principle, and we must be alert to the challenges. Um, So being asked to censor our our speech in regard to China, we just can't accept. Um, And I also want to challenge the, you know, what seems to be a prevailing view, at least with some state governments out in WA, Victoria, and some members of the, the financial and economic class, is, uh, you know, an unhealthy economic codependency on China, as if the economic relationship is the sum total of it. Of course, one in three export dollars goes to China and our prosperity is intimately tied to China, but we can have a, a strong economic relationship and at the same time maintain our sovereignty and our values. This is Tom Switzer. My guests are the federal liberal parliamentarians whom China refused access to a study tour. Senator James Patterson from Victoria and the MP Andrew Hastie from WA. Hong Kong, you both have been outspoken about China's conduct there. Um, but do the protesters really represent a movement for democracy? This is George Koo in the Asia Times. Quote, the rioters beat up on innocent bystanders. They've attacked police with gasoline bombs and sharpened metal rods. They've destroyed government buildings and metro stations. They've interrupted the operations of the international airport. Uh, James Patterson, um, do we really have a dog in this fight? I think we do, Tom. We have to stand on the side of the protesters against what is a very oppressive Chinese Communist Party encroachment uh, in Hong Kong. Let's think about who these protesters were 12 months ago. 12 months ago, they were just university students and young people going about their lives, having no interest in politics and no interest in activism. They have been radicalised by this process and they've been radicalised for very good reason. And that is because what they face in Hong Kong is existential. It is whether they still get to live in a free jurisdiction or whether they become part of a uh, an authoritarian one. Uh, And I think all the evidence that you need to be sure of that is the Chinese Communist Party's announcement this week that the Supreme Court decision in Hong Kong to overturn the face ban uh, has no status and and will not be respected by the Chinese Communist Party. That is the end to the one country, two systems uh, system as we know it. Uh, It is an end to the autonomy of Hong Kong. And it's exactly what everyone feared far, far, far before the 50 year handover is complete. But isn't time on Beijing's side, Andrew Hastie, because 28 years time, the deal is done. Hong Kong will be part of China. And that's and that's why we're seeing the protesters make a stand now. They know what's at stake. And, you know, they realise that if they if they give up now, the future belongs to a uh, authoritarian, totalitarian 
communist state, which is which is China. So that's why they're standing, and that's why I support them. I mean, if I was a student in Hong Kong, I hope I'd be brave enough to stand with them. Henry Kissinger has often said that sometimes in negotiations, when you're dealing with your opponents, it, it sometimes helps to put yourself in your opponent's shoes and look at the world from their perspective. So from that regard, isn't Hong Kong... Uh, you know, really part of the Chinese sphere of influence and uh, they will go to great lengths to protect their sphere of influence uh, if Westerners get involved. James Patterson. They might, uh, and uh, no one is proposing that Hong Kong not be part of China's sphere of influence. All we're proposing is that China agree by the conditions it itself accepted in 1997 uh, with the British government when it negotiated for the handover of Hong Kong, which is to preserve, protect and uphold the autonomy of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a very special place, and if it just becomes another administrative region of China, then it won't be the special place that it has been, and it will lose its special character. And I think that will be a very sad thing for Hong Kong a very sad thing for China and a very sad thing for the world. Okay, this brings us to the Uyghurs. From China's perspective, it's suppressing Muslims because Beijing fears ethnic rebellion and it remembers the similar uprising that that took place in the outer reaches of the Soviet Union after it liberalised in the 1980s. Of course, many Australians, many Americans think differently. We believe in the promotion of human rights and you both uh, clearly reflect that noble cause. But um, James, if you're concerned to be effective and not merely to feel virtuous, how do we really stop China from persecuting the Muslim population? I think what we're doing in speaking out already makes a difference and already helps. And it's demonstrated by the fact that the Communist Party is so sensitive to criticism and the scrutiny that's happening. I think they're being more restrained than they otherwise would be because they know that the eyes of the globe are on them, whether that's for the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang or whether it's for, for Hong Kong. But the second thing is, even if us speaking out does absolutely nothing at all, we should still do it because it's morally right. And the testimony of persecuted people throughout history is that when others spoke up for them outside their country, they took heart from that, they took hope from that, and they took courage from that. And it is the right thing for us to do to speak up for them because they can't speak for themselves. Finally, the South China Sea, you're both clearly alarmed by China's militarisation in those islands. And yet the Liberal government you both serve, Tony Abbott's government, Malcolm Turnbull's government, Scott Morrison's government, uh, they haven't participated in any freedom of navigation patrols. Uh, why is that? Andrew Hasty. Well, Tom, we're backbenchers, so we don't get to set policy, nor are we privy to the planning and operations in this space, uh, which is sensitive. Of course, I'm very sympathetic to uh, a freedom of navigation operation. We are a trading nation. Our prosperity and security depends on the free movement of our ships through the sea. So uh, it's, it's good to maintain uh, freedom of navigation through the South China Sea, but I'm not going to critique my government for not having conducted one. And um, I hope in the future that there are opportunities to do so. And James Patterson, it's interesting, the, the shadow defence spokesman, uh, Richard Miles, along with uh, uh, Kim Beasley, uh, before he became governor of WA, the former foreign minister, Gareth Evans, they're among others who have said that Labor uh, would actually support follow-up freedom of navigation patrols. Could Labor here be more hawkish against Beijing than the coalition? Well, that would be uh, quite contrary to the other evidence we have available, which is that Richard Miles was the last guest on a China Matters trip that went to China. And while he was there, he admitted that he failed to raise the case of Dr Yang Hengjun, the Australian citizen who's detained there on spurious espionage charges. And he gave a speech to the Ministry of State Security Academy uh, in which he urged closer military ties between Australia and the Chinese Communist Party. So I'd be very sceptical of any claims, any hairy chested claims made by Richard Miles or others, that they'd be more robust on this relationship. All the evidence points to the contrary. James, Andrew, great to have you on RN. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom.